Well, hello everybody and welcome to a very special edition of Sci-Fi Model Action Live. Tonight we're having our special Creating the Enterprise uh, edition, guys. We're going to be uh, fielding questions in the next uh, week. I'm going to be taking a trip out to L.A. to have a nice sit-down interview with Paul Olson and Jim Dow and Richard Taylor and others who were uh, involved in the miniature and behind-the-scenes special effects for Star Trek The Motion Picture. So what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to be fielding questions from our panel of modelers. Also going on with our regular show and tell of what's on the bench. And so those of you out there that are watching and uh, want to field some questions for us tonight, and uh, I'll be happy to take those with me out to California and uh, get those to uh, Paul and the guys. And, uh, you know, Star Trek The Motion Picture was kind of uh, a lot of unknown things about how the props and everything were made for that movie. So if you guys want to know about how they built the Enterprise or how it was painted or anything like that or any of the other uh, miniatures or props that they used, Go ahead and send your questions in. We're going to start things off tonight and go around the room and have everybody do their usual introductions first. I'm going to start at my extreme left with Mr. Adam Corville. How are you doing tonight, Adam? He's, He's got to unmute mute himself. <clears throat> there yeah, stop cooperating. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm Adam Corville. I live in southeast Texas and uh, modeled for a number of years. I'm a regular over at uh, Sci-Fi Model Action and um, contribute quite a bit over there. And uh, right now I'm just having fun, and as I always do. And uh, I'll show what I've got going a little later. That's all i got for right now. Okay, Adam. Great. Looking forward to seeing what you're working on. And up next we have Mr. Armando Della Cabada. How are you doing tonight, Armando? Busy on your bench as usual, I see. Yes, sir. Uh, doing great, Boyd. Uh, my name is Armando Della Cabada. I live in South Florida. Uh, I have a small channel called DLC Model Builders where I post my videos. And uh, I'm working on my Fine Moles 172nd Scale Millennium Falcon for the Big Spring Build. And... Uh, um, finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with all these debris leaves I've been gluing on, so I'll show you guys in a little bit how it's looking and uh, what I've done with the modifications of the uh, of the lighting. Uh, that's what I got. Excellent, Armando. Yep, he's been a grievely machine here for the past couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. Good to see you getting towards the end. That uh, build is turning out beautifully. And up next we have uh, Craig Kerr. Craig, how are you doing tonight? Tell us about yourself and where you're from, buddy. I'm oh, not too bad tonight, Lloyd. Um, Sabre UK off of Sci-Fi Model Actions Forum. Um, currently living in the UK, but in the process of moving back to Canada. Um, at the minute, I've just brought out the Aliens APC from Hibernation. Uh, that, that's what I was doing just now, just cutting some lenses for that. And um, just about finished the Enterprise. Um, Nemesis, which again, the build logs on SFMA's forum as well for that. Um, that's, that's pretty much me at the minute. Right, yeah, I've been following that, and I believe oh. you have some pictures of that posted over at the uh, Sci-Fi Model Action Google Plus site. It's a beautiful model, and really turning out nice there, Craig. It's, it's nearly finished, but I didn't touch it until later on. <laughs> After tonight, I can finish it. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay, and up next we've got our good friend Dave Pashtag, and Dave's busy on his bench tonight too. How's it going, Dave? Oh, okay, boy, thanks. My name's Dave Pashtag. I'm from Grand City, Illinois, <clears throat> a member of Sci-Fi Model Action, and doing the big spring build with my 350NX01, and I'm also doing the bridge uh, kit off to the side as I go, and just kind of hanging out and having fun. All right, Dave. Looking forward to seeing a little bit of that here in just a second. And up next, we've got Mr. Eric Hawkins with us tonight. How are you doing, Eric? Doing good. How's everybody doing tonight? Just um, fine. Just, just, uh, right now, just um, discussing some, uh, buying some models, and hopefully I can get those up before I decide not to buy any more for the rest of the year. But then I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> All right, Eric. And up next, we've got Mr. John Swaller. And John, like usual, he's busy on his bench, too. And he seems to be in a different position every week. How are you doing tonight, John? Oh, I'm doing good. Uh, no, I was having some issues around the house this past couple of weeks. Uh, front door, kitchen door, TV going out, washer, dryer going out. It's been busy, and 
I think this is the first time in like two weeks I've got to my bench. Oh man, sorry to hear that. Well, glad to see you're back to it. You're working on the Cylon Raider, aren't you, John, for the big spring buildup? Yes, I am. How's that one coming along? Not bad. I just put the underside on as uh, you guys were warming up for the show, and I sealed it, and uh, can't wait to show it off. All right, John. Looking forward to seeing that. Okay, and up next we've got somebody new with us tonight, going by the name of Lufty. How you doing tonight, Lufty? Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. You're just fine. Right. Yeah, so uh, you guys, I've met, done one of the meetups with you guys once before. My first name's Enoch, but I had to oh, change yeah. my... Yeah, I had to change my... Uh, Profile due to some security stuff uh, for Google Plus just because of my job and in school and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm back. Excellent. Welcome All back. All right. Yeah, All I'm right. working on the uh, the uh, one one thousand TOS for the spring build. All right. Well, glad to have you on tonight, Enoch. Thanks for having um, me. Up next, we've got Ralph, our good friend from Boston, Massachusetts, the electronics wizard. How you doing tonight, <laughs> Ralph? I'm doing good, boy. Thank you for asking. Um, Yep. Um, uh, my name is Ralph Tenaglia. I live in Massachusetts. We have a company called Tena Controls uh, that's making all these uh, nice little lighting kits. And tonight we have a new addition that I'd like to talk about when the time comes about a new product uh, that's uh, basically it's going to be a touch screen. Um, so you, instead of touching momentary buttons or rocker switches, you can touch a panel, and it can do something that you want it to do. Wow, how awesome is that? Looking forward to seeing that, Ralph. Yeah. What a blockbuster. That's totally cool. Okay, and up next, we've got a, wow, we've got a Captain Kirk impersonator. <laughs> Wally. Are you kidding? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Wally. <laughs> I know guys. about yourself and where you're from. Hey, Wally from Star Trek, Model of County, up here in Illinois, uh, just outside of Wisconsin, actually. And uh, we've Actually working on the Enterprise A refit on YouTube and uh, the 360 bridge also on YouTube. So just here to have some right. fun with you guys and answer questions. All right. Glad to hear that, Wally. Yeah, I've been following the videos. They look like everything's coming along really well. And uh, the videos are very informative, guys. Like we said, Wally's got his YouTube channel out there, Starfleet Model Academy. You guys can hop by there and uh, see what Wally's got going on. And... Uh, I guess uh, you guys know me. I'm Boyd Crompton. I operate the uh, Sci-Fi Model Action uh, forums for model building for people interested in Sci-Fi model kits, and uh, got my little YouTube channel, Trekworks, and just uh, happy to be hosting this little gig tonight. Uh, we're going to go around the room now and um, have everybody show a little bit of uh, what they got on their bench, and we're going to go back over to Adam over there. Adam, what you got cooking tonight? Well. We're uh, still working on the Colonial Viper from the New Battlestar Galactica series, and uh, we're pretty much got the cockpit finished now, uh, so I can take some bags off and nonsense like that. We're just doing a little airbrush before we started today. Uh, let's see here. Ah, there we go. I don't know how easy this is to see, but uh, all the decals and the pilot are set inside now. Very cool. And there's only going to be one part of it lit. Again, it's going to be kind of hard to look at, but hold on. There's a main center console in the front. And that's the only thing we've lit. But I don't know, maybe you can see it. Yeah, I can see it lit up. Hey, it looks good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice detail there. And just various works on the nose, but uh, one of the main things we've been working on for the past couple of days was, was the engines. And uh, these are going to be kind of a booger to light block, but we'll just do it from the outside. But that's what we got going so far. Ooh. Nice. And this isn't painted yet, so it's just the, the naked styrene on that guy. Right. <clears throat> but. Um, but the plan is, is that you're just going to have the center console lit and just these engines, uh, no navigation lights, nothing like that. But uh, I had a mad idea on this part. Uh, I've seen various builds where they've taken this very same model or, or a different brand, and they would just leave the uh, the engine nozzles uh, plain styrene, or they'll just put like a clear part. And very often I'll see them go blue or purple or something. 
something like that. And, and that's not really correct. Um, I was looking at some screen grabs from the TV show, and it's actually white. And there's going to be some instances where it'll look blue, but it's pure white. But I don't want to give up the engine detail inside. I think it's pretty splendid. So uh, I'll do a trick that I did on some previous models where, well, like the C57D I did a few months ago, is where you leave off the primer, leave off the light block, and just put a very, very light coat of paint. And those LEDs are powerful enough where it will still illuminate them. So uh, the, the plan is, is that once everything's together and we hook up the power source, in the off state, they look like they're covered with soot. You couldn't tell if they're clear lenses or, or even if you had an inkling if they were lit. But when you put those powerful lights behind it, it'll go right through the pigment and go through little holes and it'll look like they're burning. And uh, so that's kind of what I got cooking up on that part of it. But other than that, everything's pretty, pretty a prosaic uh, process. It's just a matter of uh, you know, just prying and painting, that sort of stuff. And at some point, we'll be putting some clear on it so we can handle it better. And as uh, if any of you are familiar with Tamiya acrylics, uh, there's a good side and bad side of those paints. Uh, the good side is they, they self-level pretty easily. And uh, they're real easy to mix. They go through the airbrush wonderfully. But especially if you use flats, uh, you cannot use them unprotected. Uh, they will scratch uh, pretty readily, and they mark. Uh, pretty easily. So as long as you get a clear lacquer on them, they're fine. But um, but yeah, before we can proceed any further and say putting the halves together and stuff like that, they'll need a little bit of clear on them. But other than that, that's that's where we are at this point. That's that's the, the tedious work. That's great stuff, Adam. That sounds like a really creative plan for doing that lighting too. Looking forward to seeing that. Thank you. Okay. And I'm up Next, we've got Armando, and Armando has been working a long time on his Millennium Falcon, and he's been uh, sending us little picture updates, and he's got a nice thread over at Sci-Fi Model Action. It's looking gorgeous, Armando. What do you got going on that tonight? Well, let me uh, switch cameras so I can show you guys a little bit more detail. Um, I have, for the most part, completed the Greedleys, I think. Uh, there's still some... Stuff I need to add and paint and then add a couple more lights. But uh, let me show you that. This is the top half. Uh, the last couple of days I've been working on uh, on adding little pipes in the areas that... Uh, Man, look at the detail on that. How cool. It's, uh, it's really cool. All these pipes I added tonight, uh, they glue them on, they cross, and they... I mean, the texture that they add to the hull is amazing. Um, these I added last night. They're uh, pieces and parts that just overlap, and they give they give the whole model depth, especially in these areas, uh, which is not something you could achieve with just a, an injected mold. I mean, they've got the right idea. This is uh, the back part. I don't know if I showed this last week, but uh, it's painted now. Um, this one's still removable because there's a screw underneath that, that secures it, the top to the bottom, and there's a couple of them around. I may leave it removable without gluing it. I've got to put the photo edge parts that need to be painted black, the grills. Um, but all the greenies are done there. Um, and this is a couple more pipes that I glued. No, didn't have too many on this side. Uh, on the bottom, there were also greenies that I... Did over the past couple of days. They need to be painted still, but as you can see, there's detail here. Um, there's detail there. All those are pipes that were glued. And you can see, they, again, they give so much depth because they're actually overlapping and, and they, they're suspended in midair. So uh, it's, it's just not something that you could achieve with an injected model that doesn't have anything else. So. Even though it's tedious, uh, in the end, it's worth it. Mm. Um, the other thing that I did was I, I settled on using the sliding potentiometers for the uh, the lighting effect on the on the main engine, and I hid them in the hangar bay uh, door. Um, if you can see them there. I don't know if you can. Let's see if I can get you some light. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yep. Yeah, mm. they're up here. Uh, I, I experimented with several different values. I had 10k ohm, 
20k ohm and 100k ohm. Um, the white LED strips, nothing cuts them down completely, not even the 100k ohm. But it does make it very faint, so I settled on that for the for the white LED strip. The blue SMDs, I, I settled on 20k ohm because 100k ohm faded them too much, even though they were shut down completely. When you tried to ramp them up, they were faint, and I didn't want them faint. I wanted them to be nice and shiny. So uh, one of them is 100k ohm for the white LEDs, and one of them is 20k ohm for the blue SMDs. And when this is all hooked up, uh, the uh, potential meter can just be slid back and forth, and it's hid. You can't see it when you look at it from here, so it's nicely hid. And uh, that's the first thing I'm going to hide. The battery, which I don't know if I've shown you guys before, is a rechargeable 12-volt, uh, 12-volt, uh, 48 mAh battery which uh, Dave Pashtag uh, uh, showed me where to get, and I thank him for it. This thing is wonderful. It lights up the whole thing, and uh, this is the part that will go to the uh, all the lighting, and this is the part that I will hide. I haven't settled on a final place for it, but I am thinking that I'll probably lay it down in here, or actually, no, it was in here that I was going to lay it down, and glue this in place right here, so that this panel is removable and I can just plug it into the charger when I need to. The panel will be removable with uh, with magnets. I don't know if I showed you guys that last week. Um, here's the panel. It sits uh, right there. And That's it'll be really a great idea, Armando. That's sweet. Yeah, it, it, it fits perfect. It doesn't, there's even space back here so I can glue it in place and just remove, plug in, and then put it back on, and that'll be it. And then the switch I'll hide in the uh, the on-off switch. I'll hide in the satellite. This thing is removable. It's 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 got a key lock. It just goes in and out. And I can put a little slip a uh, little switch right there that'll turn it on and off. So it'll be completely self-contained. All the power in it, and I can do what I want with it. I can hang it. I can put it on a, on a base or, or on a counter or shelf, anything. And that's exactly what I wanted. So when I'm done with all these last little details, I'll, I'll seal it up, get the wiring all set up, and then starts the part with about the uh, all the weathering, which is going to be the real uh, meat of the potatoes here, I guess. <laughs> it's what's going to make it look good or not good. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping I can do a good job with it. But that's what I've done so far. Beautiful, Armando. That's really come together. Yeah, and even even in the low-resolution uh, webcam, all that detail shows up on that. That's incredible. Beautiful model. Really yeah. like the uh, um, magnetic uh, door uh, hider for your um, access. That's really cool. That's a really cool idea. I've seen that a couple other places, and I'm hoping to use that same technique in the future. Yeah, that's great. Um, how would you guys um, secure the magnets to the styrene? Well, the magnets are powerful enough that it, they'll they'll penetrate right through the plastic. I, I was thinking of putting one here and one here, and then on on the panel itself, one here and one here, and uh, and see how it fits. I mean, if I can get away with gluing the inner ones on the inside and it works, that'll be fine. If not, I can always wear down the plastic until the the model the the magnet is close enough that I'll get contact and, and it'll stick. Uh, either way, it's uh, I'm I'm pretty confident I can get it to work. And yeah, the magnet is strong. You won't have any problem getting them to stick to each other. I was just wondering how would you adhere it to the styrene high glue or something else? Well, uh, I guess I was going to use CA glue. Uh, see how that worked. It's worked fine for everything else that I've done so far. Okay. Mm -hmm. If anybody else has a suggestion on. Always on open. I think that'll work good. One thing you might uh, think too, Armando, is that uh, those magnets, if they're those uh, ones that I'm thinking of, they're super powerful. Um, you might not necessarily have to put a, another magnet on the panel. You could maybe get like a thin strip of metal or brass or copper or something and put that on That's there. And, and yeah. the magnets are the magnets are going to grab that. You know, you, you might not necessarily need to have another magnet on there if it's going to be too thick or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's such a good idea. Yeah, yeah just, just regular one, steel. Yeah. One thing I found at Walmart uh, in like magnetic 
it's this is like a thin magnetic strip that you can cut pieces out of. Uh -huh. Right. And it's got a sticky back to it. Oh, look at so, that. Yeah. So like magnetic tape. Yeah, pretty much is like magnetic tape, and it's an idea that I thought about that if you know I can't get like a regular magnet, you know, you can do whatever you want with it, hopefully, and hopefully be strong enough, you know, and cut out where you need it. Uh, yeah, I, I tried something like that, Dave, with, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I actually robbed it from my, my wife had a couple of those little magnetic signs on the refrigerator that were little things, and they, they were like that, and the, and by the time you put it and you try to go through any kind of plastic with it, they're just not strong enough. Oh, really? Yeah, I was, I was just trying to get that little, uh, when I did my Enterprise refit, I was just trying to get that little, uh, shuttle uh, travel pod to stick on there and uh, it wasn't even strong enough to hold that up at all you're gonna have to use some pretty strong magnets when you by the time you go through the plastic ah, okay we have a, a, a pair of circular uh, magnets that I got off of a uh, brochure I, uh, I got in the mail and uh, they're pretty strong I may end up just using these they, they work pretty nicely mm -hmm. uh, they're the red earth magnets yeah, yeah, those exactly. things are super strong. Yeah. Yeah, but if you if you glue one of those or two of those on the inside of that plastic and then put a a sheet a something you know something metallic on that, it's going to hold that on there. I mean, it'll grab that really strong. You yeah, don't want it to be so strong that it's hard to get it off of there either. Oh, you know. That should just right. be able to pop it off. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. I think I'll do that. And they do have uh, smaller sizes that we need it. They work. Yep. Well, I'm going to go to Walmart. I'm going to look around and see what they got. You probably got to go to um, a hobby shop like uh, Hobby Town or even on uh, that's the website. But look up Nickel Academy um, Magnets on the internet. You'll find uh, supplies for the all different sizes. All right. All right. Well, thanks for showing that, Armando. That's beautiful. And everybody's anxious, anxiously awaiting the finish of that one. You got a lot of followers over at the. Uh, forums on that one too so that's great and up next we got Craig and Craig's gonna show us the big reveal of what he's been working on with Ralph here for a little while what Rumble. you got going on there Craig <laughs> we're doing the big reveal now then <laughs> okay yeah. well as he's as Craig is setting up um, I'm gonna lead into a little bit uh, uh, as you guys know Craig hasn't been on this uh, forum before I don't believe um, so you guys might have heard me in the past that we're working on something. And I couldn't, you know, say exactly what it was because I had a, a customer that, uh, you know, was had purchased it and he was going to set it all up and everything. So, well, now you know the secret customer. It's Craig. <laughs> and um, Craig uh, wanted a certain type of technology, uh, and we didn't have it at the time. And he said, can you do it? So I said, well, Let's take a look at it. So, so now you know who the customer is. And uh, Craig, you want to take it away and show these guys what we've been working on for the last few months? What you've been working on for the last few months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, let's try and get that webcam removed around. Well, as you know, I've been doing the, the Nemesis build. Okay. Can you guys see that all right? Yeah. Yes. Got the it's model in the picture now. Yep. Beautiful. Yeah, so that that's the the build. It was, the base was originally for Voyager, but I've, I've put it onto Nemesis instead. Um, so what what I've actually done is I've made an L cars panel, a touch screen L cars panel, um, for the, for the actual ship to sit on. It's it sat in a picture frame at the minute, but my woodworking skills are absolutely pants, so I'm having like a, a custom L cars console made for, for the screen to sit into. So th this isn't the finished thing. This is just to show you what it is. Um, th this one has three buttons on it. Uh, it's hidden behind the grey panels down the side here, just at, at the minute, just purely because it's not finished. I've got to, f got to finish the screen off. The first button is around about here, and when you tap it, it puts the L cars noise on. Uh, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, that sound is to scale. When you're in the room, it actually sounds pretty loud. I know it doesn't yeah, transfer I can hear well it pretty clear, yeah. through the internet, but um, that's what it is. Yeah, so that, that's the first button, and like Ralph says, it is actually quite loud. Um, it's just my headphones are crap. 
the second button is around about the nacelle area, which turns on the, the base lighting. So once that comes on, oh, it, nice. it brings up the L cars panel. Um, there's still a little bit of light blocking to do on the back there. You can still see the, the strip lighting behind there. It, it don't look that bad in the flesh, but it does on the camera, but you get the gist. And then the third button's up here, and when you press that, it turns the ship on. Wow. How oh, cool. I want one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> turn the lights off. There's Nemesis in the dark. A lot uh, of windows. Nemesis, Nem Nemesis has also got um, Ralph's plasma board in the buzzards as well, which is what's flicking her away. And then the impulse yeah. engines are two flickering red LEDs, which we won't go into again, eh, Ralph? No, that's okay. They, um, they, have, a, they have a life where they belong, I understand. They all have their places. So, yeah, I've got the plasma thing in the buzzards, flickering LEDs in the impulse engines, and the rest of it's just strip lighting. Um, there, there's underneath the assist and everything as well, the hull and everything. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, nice. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're working on. Um, I don't know how well that looks on your screens in the dark with the the L cars panel. Well, it looks a little washed out, but the camera always does that. Yeah, I'm sure it looks great in person. Yeah, it it's pretty much crystal clear when when you're looking at it in the flesh. Um, Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's so, what we're you working made, on. Um, you made that Elkars panel? Yeah, I did. It, it's, on a, it's glass. It's a glass screen. And the actual Elkars panel is um, printed onto acetate, you know, like OHP paper, see-through right. um, paper. That's That's been printed up and then stuck to the glass. And then behind that, I, I can't show you it because... Everything will fall apart because it's not all attached properly. Um, but yeah, it, it's all stuck stuck down at the back, and it, it's been lit by uh, three strip LEDs, three strip white LEDs behind there, which you can obviously see on the, on the glass when it's on. Um, and then behind that is the board that that Ralph's board and everything's attached to, with the speakers and. The power supply from the ship and everything, that's all behind there, all on one board. So it all comes out in one sort of like cassette. So when I get the actual proper console to go around it, it will just slide straight into that, and I don't need to do anything else. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much what, we, what we've been working on. Wow. Nice. Very nice. That's like, gorgeous. Like, like Craig said, we had, it was like a few months, but <clears throat> mainly... Like uh, this is the first time we're showing on on this uh, you know Google Plus venue. We were on another one last night at, at, because they were on before. Uh, but uh, basically, you know, I had it. Uh, it took about a good two months to to get it everything just right. Uh, on paper, it looked great, but uh, you know, uh, for a lot of folks that do design, uh, the first cut brings you into the ballpark but then you have to tweak all the inconsistencies out and tolerances so we had it took about a couple of months and then I sat on it for a while doing additional testing stress testing and everything to find out its weaknesses and uh, we you need a good power supply for sure because whereas where it's a touch technology it works on the capacitance of your fingers uh, or finger in this case because you only just want to touch that one particular button you wish. Um, so since it works on capacitance, what what it needs to do, it needs to synchronize itself to the, the world around itself. I'm giving it life to this inanimate object, but it needs to synchronize itself to its surrounding. And then once it's no, it has its baseline, then when you touch it, it knows from the change in capacitance that uh, somebody, you know, it's doing, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing is you're engaging it and you want to perform a particular function. And in, in Craig's case, what the buttons do, button one, as you saw, turns on the L cars. But what you might not have heard, because again, it doesn't transmit well through the internet, is that every time you hit a button, there's a beep sound that's associated with that button. 
So it's it's basically ta almost like a tactile feedback for human beings, for you and I, that you know that you hit that button, you've touched it. So there's a little beep every time you hit one of those three buttons. Not only will it do its function that it's designed to do, it'll also beep. So when you turn the L cars on sound, there's a beep and the L cars comes on as well simultaneously. When you turn the underneath lighting on, there's a beep and the light comes on. You turn on the ship, you know, the beep, the light comes on. So that way you, you know you've hit that button. You don't have to think twice about it. Hey, did I, did I hit that button or not? So that's just a human factor interaction situation. Uh, but we can do other things with it. Um, this was the, the first cut. Um, well, it's already, Craig, believe it or not, it's already in the drawing board to get changed and new features added and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it was a big expense, you know, but it's something that I felt um, happy doing because it was a very cool thing. So whether we sell quite a few of them or not too many, um, I was happy to do it uh, because it was something new and you guys are always looking for something new and fun. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so <laughs> so um, there it is. Um, and um, cool. you know, I'm happy we, we got it working. Craig was pretty much instrumental on his end to get everything tidied up because it does need to be set up correctly in order to get it uh, functioning um, at least repeat, uh, you know, repeatedly and uh, in a robust situation. So you did a great job. Thank you, Craig. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I definitely learned arc welding into soldering. <laughs> <laughs> so do these buttons, can, can they be used to actuate not just on-off but uh, momentary style? Uh, yes. Yeah, we, what it is is basically there's a front end Amando, that's the capacitive touch system. Now, in Craig's case, <clears throat> he's got three buttons, and you touch it. It's a, when once you touch it, it's actually a momentary signal that goes to the microprocessor computer, mm -hmm. and then from there you can do whatever you want. You want that touch to be momentary, or do you want that touch to turn something on and stay on until you touch it again? You see what I'm saying? So it can be a latch or it can be a toggle, you know? Oh, okay. How uh, many buttons can well, you add on there? That's what I was going to ask. How many uh, inputs can you put on there, Ralph? Okay. Um, this particular one, the way I, I've set it up is uh, that's why it's being redesigned so we can have more outputs. Uh, right now it's set up with three buttons and three outputs. Now we can, it, it's a total of seven, so we can have either three inputs, four outputs, Actually, in the board that Craig has, we can only have three outputs, but we could have four inputs. That will be a total of seven. But in the future, we can have seven buttons, or we'll see how it goes. But wh why I paused is we can have more than seven buttons. Okay, We could have 14. We can have 21. Or we can go in increments in between. Uh, we can have 10. We can have 13. You see what I'm saying? And we can have more outputs. It's just a matter of how many, um, what size microprocessor we used, and how many of these touch technology front ends we want to put on one board. And um, we can go with I.O. expanders, which means that we could literally drive hundreds of outputs if we wanted to. So, you know, it's, it's pretty wide open. It's uh, just a matter of how many microprocessors we want to use, how many touch systems we want to use. Uh, but I'm happy that it's a, it's a robust system. I, I mean, I've seen you. I'm, I'm sure you guys can go on the internet and Google touch, capacitive touch, and you see even kids are doing it. Uh, but the problem is, is lighting an LED is one thing. Lighting a ship that, like in Craig's case, I'm, I got to be honest, Craig, that power supply I didn't think was going to uh, run that ship and the L cars because of the spec. But it's mm -hmm. obviously it's doing it, so you bought a good power supply. But in exactly. reality, in Power reality, <laughs> if, if you if you have a ship that draws like three quarters of an amp, which is 750 mils, you need a good power supply that can put out an amp or two, because we want to have a nice smooth power exchange from the power adapter to the board um, to make it work correctly. So there's a lot of caveats with this system. 
So I think we've ironed out the bugs with it, and um, I'm, I'm happy that uh, we were able to get it off the ground and and and, uh, and get it working for Craig. And that's I'm I'm happy, and we'll we'll do you know more things in the future. But um, it was a good start. Um, awesome, Ralph. The uh, the touch interface. Uh, can it be hidden under another surface, or does it have to be exposed for it to work? It, okay, the, the spe specification is that we can have a 10 millimeter max of depth. Now, uh, in, it can work through plastic or glass. Craig had a, had a situation where he needed to go to glass uh, to, to get the effects that he wanted. Uh, but uh, and his is now kind of sensitive. Actually, Craig, you can actually don't even have to touch the glass to turn it on. Correct? Yeah, I, c I can hold my finger about ten mil above the glass, and it will yeah. activate the switch. Now there is a way to desensitize that, but because we, you know, we got it working and we're doing all these uh, no, promotional. Yeah. That's huh? fine. The reason I ask is because obviously I'd I'd like to try and hide it under an L cars panel, so the panel itself. Is is the actual actuator, uh, just like in the show? That's that's exactly. why I ask. Now, I Craig's has his thing, and I've been so busy. I actually have a um, <clears throat> a shadow box that you guys have all used in the past. There, I've seen them. Uh, what I did is I printed out an L cars of a ship. I I forget what it was because it's such a long time ago, and I haven't gotten back to it. I did it on paper, just regular white paper. And it's colored, you know. The L cars is colored. I printed it on an ink inkjet, and that way, because it's on paper, it's not see-through like in Craig's case. So I can put those metal. Oh, by the way, the buttons are um, a metal button. They're paper thin. We happen to have brass uh, shield that's like a paper, so I can cut them, and we can cut them in circles or rectangles or square them and. We connect it to a, a wire that goes back to the board, and that's your capacitive touch sensor, if you, for lack of a better word. So you can put it anywhere, and um, you know, I, I think with my paper approach, you won't see it. It'll be behind the L cars, so you can actually touch the L cars on the screen, and it'll do your activation, whatever you want. Yeah, ten millimeter. That's pretty thick, actually. That's almost like a quarter of an inch. Right. Yeah, that's sure. great. That means you could put it on, on just about any kind of uh, plexi or whatever you wanted to put over top of it. Whatever you had right. printed on there, that's great. Yeah. The yep. touch, the touch. Could you set that up so that if you, um, you know, selected the touch screen, it could also lay additional LEDs, you know, on the actual uh, um, L cars panel. So, as if you, you know, could you put the buttons like on an L cars? Item, for example, and then also allow that to be underlit by LED, and then also activate some whatever else you want. Yeah, in other words, when you hit the button, it lights up. Yeah. Yeah, like we the can specific L cars feature. You know, like if it were like you know engines, for for example. So for example, if you touch the, you know the, uh, the engine, you know engine image on the L car system. Would that light up, and also could you also set that to light up the engines, for example, yeah. as if it were an actual usable L cars panel? Well, it's up to you. Wherever you put the the lights, that's what's going to light up. I that's mean, pretty amazing, Ralph. Because I mean, if you think about that, if you if you've got a custom display box that um, you know you put all this time and effort into, and then you've got you know and the ship corresponds to having L cars, so TNG or whatnot. If you could actually make that display box look like an active working L car system, that is. Absolutely amazing, dude. I mean, I, I mean, I for one, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not sure what the cost is, but the amount of time you're putting into a model and just for wow factor, having a functional touchscreen L cars display system is absolutely mind blowing, man. Yeah, I think well, Craig, when Craig gets his done, it's actually going to be like that. He's going to have the switches yeah. right in, you know, underneath the L cars. Uh, so. He, he just did this for a quick... Oh, for display purposes. Right, right, right. Yeah. Gotcha. Exactly. That's it's pretty awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's what I would want to do, too. I mean, that has so many other applications, not just for modeling. I mean, you could set up L oh, yeah. display oh, he... systems for all kinds of cool stuff or or whatever. Yeah, you know, you know, you know this is... Um, you, guys, you guys know that I have that car line 
uh, boards for the cars, and we use a mag it's got a magnetic reed switch that you can put anywhere in the car, and then you use a magnet to swipe over it, and you know it makes a momentary closure on the magnetic switch. Well, uh, technically, we can put the touch system in that. So you just touch the part of the car with that uh, uh, metal switch is hiding behind, or wherever you want to set. So instead of using a magnet, now you can use your finger. Yeah. 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 You know? That's super cool. That is super cool. Uh, the yeah. gears are already turning in my head, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, I, yeah mine too. I, I figured it would. Uh, but give me time. Okay, give me some time. we got a few, we got about five different projects to get through. He sounds like Jerry. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Look at Jerry. He's so busy. He's not, he's not even able to come on. <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks so much for sharing with that, that with us, guys, and everybody that's watching. I wanted to s mention we've got uh, Destroyed Viper and the model dude who checked in. They say hi. And, uh, yeah, that's just really awesome. That uh, That's going to be quite unique and a whole new world opening up for modelers out there with their displays. So that's fantastic, Ralph. Kudos to you guys, both of you guys, for working on that and getting that worked out. Thanks, yeah. guys. <clears throat> Absolutely. Okay. Man. And uh, Dave, we're, you're up next, buddy, and what have you got going on tonight? I think you're going to see a little bit of NX-01, aren't we? Yeah, well, I've been working on my bridge. I was going to show that. I was working on sanding some of the floor and stuff earlier. And I'm also uh, test trying out some uh, decals for HDA Model Works. He wants to put out a paint, uh, paint mask set for the bridge set, which helps out a lot as far as the little windows and... So it, it's coming out really good, and hopefully he'll have that coming out soon. So I've been working on the bridge kit a little bit. And then, yes, I got my NX-01 up here. I got it all sealed up the other day. and okay. All in one piece. All in one piece. Been doing some little you know, seam work and got to go back and hit it. But as Mondo says, I use the same battery as him. It's all self-contained. I uh, got Ralph's board in here. I installed a little micro switch on the side of this right here so I can turn it on. Nice. Oh, wow. <laughs> Very, Very, cool. Very cool. Then he was talking about the magnet switch, and I have the magnet switch to control the bassard right in here. Somewhere in there. But it slows them down. And right now I've got some liquid mask over the Bessard, so they kind of look kind of goofy. But um, it's getting there. Like I say, it's totally um, self-contained now. And I plan on hanging it. Look at that. <laughs> that is really cool, Dave. I still oh. love that ship. I'm on record. I love that ship. I think I like it better than the refit. I'm sorry, yeah. guys. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's a cool model. What I did with mine is where you normally, they have you put the rod up in here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, cut, I cut that out on the inside, and that's where I put the piece down where I put the wall wart to recharge it. There you go. Yeah. Right, right there. And then there's a piece uh -huh. that they offer. They tell you not to use it if you use the rod. Well, I'm not using the rod, plus I put some little pieces of the fiber in there uh, that will go up in here. And the same way, I'm going to find some magnets, like Amondo said, if I can get it up in here. And what it'll do is it'll cover it. Yeah, look at yeah. that. Yeah. Yep. I did nicely, and uh, you can take it on and off. Yeah. Right. Then you just take it off. I put my plug, you know, plug in there to recharge it up and um, go from there. But I'm getting ready to paint. I've got... I'm also my shuttle bay. I haven't got the shuttles in there, but I put some cotton in there because I'm going to be painting around that. Trying to touch up some stuff and sanding and getting it going, but once I'm done with that, and I, I got to put the decals on. I've got the uh, A-Creation um, uh, Aztecs. Yeah, Aztec decals. I was trying to think of it there. So <laughs> I used one of Jerry's little the little tiny SMDs in front, and I think it's going to work out well for that light right here in front. That's yeah, I was noticing that. Yeah, that looks great. 
Yep. And, and, it's, fiber optic. and when it's so small that you don't even see it. No. No, that's wonderful. Yep. Yeah, it it works out good. Them them things you you sneeze and you'll blow them right off your table. <laughs> so you have right. to watch. Which product is that again? That's that's what I've had rolling, so yeah, it's coming right along here. Well, uh, we're, getting a, really uh, cool. we're getting a real treat. We're getting a real treat tonight, guys. Those are two fantastic yeah. and Armando ship too. I mean, wonderful job, guys. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for showing that, Dave. Great work on that. I'm looking forward to more progress on that one. And Eric, what are you planning on again? What are you working on in the future? Well, thinking about three original battleships. I mean, sorry, battle stars from uh, Mobius, and I'm going to combine two of them, lengthen and widen one. I'm just working on a few things with that, and trimming down my uh, my stash so I made a um, trade I traded three of my band starships for one of my favorite fighters of all time. I'm having a Buck Rogers Starfighter. The Buck Rogers Starfighter? And, yes sir. Oh. And I'm thinking about ways of lightning and improving that so Roth may be getting a call from me for that. All right. <laughs> Love to see you get into some lighting and stuff, Eric. That'll be cool. Yeah, I'm taking most of the ladies' blues and uh, the cockpit. And I'm not sure, but I think I may even have a Buck Rogers cockpit from uh, StarCraft, I believe they put it out years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to find that. So I may even already have a cockpit for it because it didn't come with the cockpit when it was the first issue. Mm, okay. Be looking forward to that one. On. I know there's quite a few guys that we have on TeamSpeak and stuff talking about that, that they're big fans of that Starfighter. I guess it's a hard-to-find kit, too, huh? Oh, yeah, it's expensive, too. But I don't have time to uh, keep looking for it, keep owning, you know, bidding on eBay. Somebody who had the time and they were willing to uh, uh, do that and uh, pay for the model, and I just trade them through the models that they wanted. So mm -hmm. that worked out fine for me. That's great. Okay, and up next we've got John, and John's working on his Cylon Raider. How's that going, John? I'll tell you what. <laughs> Compared to Mondo, Greg, it's it's painted. <laughs> no, it, it's, uh, <laughs> I got the. Uh, I'm using the uh, metalizer uh, stainless on it right now, and uh, I got I just got done doing the bottom right at the beginning of the show, and then. Uh, Hopefully I can go in. I'm going to let it sit overnight and go in and start putting in the uh, secondary colors and stuff. And I do got the uh, the main, they call it the main control unit, lidded. Doesn't look too bad. And I did try the uh, pledge on it. It didn't turn out too shabby. And Great. I, since I didn't get any decals, well, the decals for it, and uh, I think I'll just paint them in and be done with it. I'm just happy to be back at my bench. I've been on and off so so much the last two weeks. It's like I gotta find out where I left off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, John, is that gonna have the little uh, the eye going back and forth there in the front? No, sir. I just got a, a red SMD 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 in the front. Oh, that'll look good anyway. Yeah. And then uh, I hear there are some kits out there that doesn't have this little window in the back. Uh, oh. Not a window, uh, like a breathing hole, you might say. I don't know. And uh, I got a little purple light up in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just uh, see what – oh, lost my electrical. <laughs> oh, it's Other than that, that's basically where I'm at. you able to have some fun doing – you say you're using some all clads on that paint job? Uh, no, it's the uh, – uh, Metalizer. The metalizer. Is that the stuff that you have to buff, John, after you paint it? Uh, the stainless is the buffing, and the uh, metal, and the uh, I think it's the uh, I think it's rust for thrusters or something like that for the engines I'm going to use. It's not buffing. 
Okay. And uh, to, uh, talk about a little bit to everybody that's watching and might be interested. How do you go about buffing that? What do you use to buff that stuff? Well, I happen to have a uh, an old uh, eyeglass cleaner. Okay. Those kits, and it seems soft enough. But you know, I used to on my NXL one. I used uh, paper towels. Didn't seem to, to harm it any. But I'm out of paper towels right now. And I found that laying around, so I've been using that. And uh, doesn't look too shabby. I'm 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 impressed. So no, in other words, yeah. whatever you use, it's it's a very very fine. Uh, uh, it's not uh, any kind of abrasive of any kind, like a like a sandpaper or emery cloth. It's a really yeah. fine material you that you want to use. Just give it a nice coat. About ten minutes later, you can come back and just get a little buff and bring it up to shine and a coat of uh, the future. And, uh, I'm still having issues with the uh, lint in the air. I mean, I can blow it off with my compressor, spray it, come back, and it just seems like. Just grab it. Do you uh, you need to get yourself a little supply, a couple of those uh, tack rags that they call them there, John? Tack cloth. It it, see, it seems to do uh, sufficient. It, it doesn't help. Spray it off with the air compressor and then hit it. And mm. Luckily, I've been able to buff them out. It doesn't leave yeah. them. It, it just makes me wonder with the with the buffing or something that uh, you're creating some. Uh, static electricity that's maybe drawing the stuff onto it because that'll definitely do it. I've also been using the cheesecloth too, and uh, I've just been dealing with it. I just hope it doesn't happen when I go do the uh, toss and the 350. I would just go nuts. You know? hey, John, how close are you to your like uh, your monitor? <laughs> my, to my monitor, my monitor is right here. Yeah, is that collecting dust too? Oh, uh, not really. Okay, because I noticed, uh, especially the old uh, monitors and TVs, some of them, they will collect dust when, when electricity is on. They just sort of create that field, start tracking dust. Oh, yeah, the screen does get it now and then. And the paints that you're using, John, you're, you're spraying them out of a can or something, right? No, it's airbrush. Ah, well, there. That, that's what I'm wondering. Now, um, I'm wondering if you're getting, if you're what you think you're getting is... Um, Stuff from your room, but what's actually coming through your airbrush are micro particles of paint. Are you running your paint through a strainer before you put it in your airbrush? A uh, brand new bottle. Um, everything's nice and cleaned out, and I just it it seems like hair. It, well, <laughs> okay. Saying, I ain't saying it's six inches long or anything like that, but it just seems to be here and there, and you gotta make sure it ain't there when you go to seal it and stuff like that. Okay, because, uh, I mean, well, my experience, uh, John, even brand new paint, I mean, right out of the factory bottle, you you have to strain it because uh, it will have little micro chunks of stuff in it. Oh. Yeah, and John. You can, your, your, your paint supply store or wherever you're getting your paint from, usually whenever you buy some paint, they'll throw in a few free uh, strainers for uh, with it, or you can find them somewhere. Uh -huh. yeah, I, re I rec recently bought the uh, in-bottle strainer, and I have yet to use it, so I might give that a shot and see what happens. Yeah, because, I mean, I, uh, I'll take brand new paint, and, and what I'll, in fact, what I'll even do is I'll take and put two strainers together, I mean, you know, overlapping each other, and you pour it through there, and you will see, when you, you know, after it drains out, you'll see some pretty ugly chunks in there. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, even on brand new paint. So, Where do you get those tack rags at? Um, usually any auto parts store, they have them in their paint, you know, section or whatever, wherever, wherever they sell the Bondo or the stuff for doing painting on cars and stuff. Uh, I mean, right up here at my local AutoZone, they have them. Okay. But they are, they're supposed to, uh, not only, you know, get the dust off there, they're supposed to, uh, neutralize, uh, uh a static buildup too, you know, they're supposed to break that up. I ask you that. So and, that would probably help, eh? But when you when you mention that you're spraying, you know, not out of a can, but out of a bottle or whatever, yeah, I would definitely strain your paint because uh, I don't, I don't never take any chances with that. I strain all the paint that I spray. The only thing I can't sp uh, strain is primer, you know. But most of the time, you spray primer, you sand that down afterwards anyway, and you get rid of any of the little garbage that gets into that. But uh, yep, it definitely makes a difference. Hmm. Thank you. I'll do that. Yep, hopefully that'll help you out. Okay, and then Enoch, you're up next. What have you got working on there, bud? 
Hey guys, uh, so uh, I'm on, just got on spring break uh, this week, so I haven't had a whole lot of time. To, uh, I need to get another camera so you can see my bench. I've just completely reorganized my work area here, um, just because we have a complicated living situation in this tiny apartment we live in in San Francisco. Um, but uh, I have been able to finish up um, <clears throat> with my nacelle priming, which is done. So these guys are done. Um, they're ready for paint. Uh, thankfully, um, my compressor just showed up. Uh, so now I'm officially with a real uh, airbrush setup, um, which is great. Um, I'm not going to pull it out. It's underneath my desk there. Uh, so I'm pretty much ready to tackle um, my painting. I find, finished my test fitting for the 1-1000 Constitution class Enterprise. Um, so pretty much everything's primed up, or pretty much everything's uh, uh, been puttied, and um, now it's ready for uh, first application of paint. So um, I'm waiting for a couple of parts to come in. I'm scratch building a spray booth for my room here. Um, so I ordered some stuff from uh, Cooler Guys. I ordered some custom tubing and a uh, 110 CFM 120-millimeter uh, fan that I'm going to be using. It's an industrial-grade 120-millimeter fan, not normally for regular computer use or anything. It's a burly fan um, for server and industrial applications. So it's 110 CFM, which is about twice of what, like, say, for example, a bathroom fan pulls um, for, like, Three quarters of the cost, um, so I still got that to put together. Um, so I got a lot of sub projects going on at the same time, um, but essentially they're all to get ready for painting because we've got what um, uh, the rest about of this month, the next month and a half. So it gives me about six weeks. So hopefully by the end of this week I'll have all that stuff set up, and that will give me about four weeks to do um, my uh, painting and then and and finalizing because all the rest of the parts have been putted and they look pretty good. Um, that's another thing I was going to ask you guys. Uh, just uh, this is a totally newbie question, so uh, <laughs> if you could bear with me, um, what I found on this build because I've been working on the 12500 scale series models before this, um, basically because I came from a miniaturist background, but uh, on the 1000 scale and larger, um, and I've talked to a few guys on the forum too that. Um, I'm finding that uh, you know puttying and priming is not a one-shot deal. Um, it's usually like a one or I'm finding a two or even three or four stage process. I don't know if you guys can give me any feedback there, just to make sure, just particularly for seams. Um, and then my other question for you guys is, if you don't mind me asking a couple of questions, is um, Boyd, I've noticed that on your builds, um, you tend to um, like, for example, a saucer section, you'll not assemble the two saucer sections. Um, you'll paint those um, pretty much completed and then assemble and then putty and, uh, you know, putty them um, and then do a set, you know, a, a tr touch up the paint, I guess, on the seam. Um, is that something you guys recommend doing? Well, uh, I guess I'll hit that one first for you. Um, I, I, first of all, everybody has their own way of doing that. And, um, my my uh, I guess the reason I do that is I just find that it's easier to do all the general painting on the parts of the model when the model is is not in one piece, especially if you're uh, talking about a big model like a 350, you know, where you've got all these huge nacelles hanging out there and you got all this stuff, and when you're trying to paint the model and get all a nice even coat of paint on it, um, you're you know you're flopping it upside down, turning it all around, and doing all these things, and oh. um, uh, you know, you can just get a, a, a nice, for me anyway, a nice uh, complete and even paint job on the parts when they're just individual parts. And uh, then going back and just doing, you know, carefully masking off only where the seams are and just putting those areas only, keeping your putty at a minimum and sanding it down and then priming it and painting it. But, uh, you know, you're right, about, you're right about the putty thing. Um, you know, a couple guys uh, that I've talked to about that, and one of the things, I think Armando was one of them, you know, he was mentioned on one of his kits that he was trying to do. Now, one important step you need to do on your seam work is uh, you need to sand down the seams and get the model fitting as good as you can before you even start doing any putty work. In other yeah. words, if you look at the edges and you get you have what they call a step, in other words, say your top saucer is laying onto the bottom saucer and you look around the edge of it and you can maybe see in a certain spot or maybe all the way around depending on how the part fits that there's a 
one part that maybe sticks out and hangs over the edge a little bit or one part of it has like a little recessed area where it's not lined up. Sure. You want to go around and you want to sand that and get all those things worked in as good as you possibly can to where they look as good as they can and the seam looks minimal without, you know, before even doing any putty work. And that's a really important step because what tends to happen to people is that they don't do that. And when you put your putty on there and you start sanding, right, your your putty is way softer than your plastic. So when you start sanding the material away, you're sanding away the putty, but the hard part of the plastic comes back through and you got this uneven spot again. You know, it just keeps coming back. Yeah. Uh, now, yes. on, on a seam, uh, I can't remember which video I did a, a while back. Uh, I think I was talking about something on the like the 350 TOS. I was showing uh, puttying the uh, nacelles or something like that. Now, putty tends to shrink, so what you want to do is you put a coat of putty on there, you know, and you want to keep your putty pretty thin. You don't want to put it on there very thick or it takes forever for it to dry. You know, you want to put it out there kind of thin. And if you use like the red putty or squadron putty, which are my two favorites for doing, you know, minor seam work, you'll notice that if you put it on there fairly thin, you know, and it looks like the seam is gone, you let it sit for maybe 15 or 20 minutes and you come back and look at it, you can see where the putty shrank, you know, when it dries it shrinks. Yeah. And you can see where it actually drew itself back down into the seam. Now, to where you can see the seam again. You see what I mean? So, like, yeah. if you if you sand that down right away, you're gonna you're not gonna get rid of it. You're gonna see that seam. You know, it's gonna reappear. So instead of doing that, wait till it's good and dry, and come back and put another layer of putty over top of that. And then you'll see that that second time, and it might take two, maybe three times sometimes, depending on right. how severe the seam is. Um, you'll see that it eventually it will level out when it's dry and you won't see it appear anymore. That's when it's time to start sanding it down. Right. Sanding. That's that's pretty much what that's pretty much what I've been doing with this the second build and it's working out way better. Um, mm -hmm. And but the, the the my curiosity is is you know when you've got everything like particularly the saucers you know you've got those all painted up just the way you want you know prior to doing any fancy painting and I'm assuming you wouldn't be doing any. Uh, um, uh, decals at that point, but um, going through that whole process with two painted saucer sections seems really spooky to me <laughs> right now. <laughs> so, do you know what I mean? Like, that seems really spooky. Like, you know, yeah, I get like it all said, painted and then I'm like, oh man, i got to tackle the most important seam on my project. So, I'm yeah. kind of, well, everybody's I'm kind of different. towards not doing that. Yeah. No, that's fine. Everybody's different. I mean, some people, like I said, they... They prefer to build the entire model and then paint it. You know what I mean? Uh, there yeah, are, there are all different do, ways. And I don't think I'm going to do that. I think I'll do, you know, the secondary hull, you know, paint, prime, and, or, you know, prime and putty and get that all looking great and primed so there's no seams with a primer coat on there and then do the same thing with the saucer section. The only question is I'll have to use some uh, liquid mask or something on those um, those little uh, starboard and uh, port lights on the top and the bottom, the clear parts and stuff. Uh -huh. um, if I if I assemble both sections, so I'm kind of leaning towards that, just so I can <laughs> not freak out about that seam that runs along the saucer section. But like you said, going your method would work as long as I make absolutely sure that that test fit is as on par. Um, doing some, you know, absolutely light sanding on the seams for the plastic itself on the test fit. So. Thanks, thanks for that. That's going to help. Sure thing. Okay, well, we got a quick second. I want to say our good friend uh, Chris Whitford made it into the room. Mm -hmm. And how are you doing tonight, Chris? Good to see uh, you. And tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're working on real quick. Well, as much as you know, I'm Christopher Whitford, owner of a little community called Sci-Fi Fans and Models United. I run a little YouTube channel called Christopher Whitford. deals with model building, shows, things of that nature. And working on for the last couple of weeks for the spring uh, build, a uh, certain superhero. Which y'all know is, there he uh, is. Superman. Yeah. Looking awesome. good. Cue the music. The cape drama. <laughs> oh, yes. And speaking of cape drama. Yeah. Uh, it's been a real caper. <laughs> oh, here all we folks. Oh, God, you're getting worse, worse on these puns, Boyd. I don't know how many more I can take because it's really being a seam. <laughs> anyway, uh, 
got the inside of the cake painted. Still have a little seam on the inside there. As you can see, it's not as big as it's been before, but still knocking it down, knocking it down, knocking it down. Of course, you all seen the back. Yeah, looks good. Yeah, looks good. And uh, my last little update, I uh, have added something to give the man of steel a little bit more human look. He has flesh on him. Yeah, it looks a lot better, yeah. A little bit more shading, brings mm -hmm. out the details. Yeah, that's looking good. So, matter of fact, uh, if you'll look, try to get his hands here in the shot. Yeah. yeah. Get some details nice. done on the hands. Only problem is right now is uh, trying to get the area's mask off for his trunks and his boots so I can shoot the red. And then waiting for the weather to clear up to where I can shoot the red. So, Very nice, Chris. Thanks for the update, and we're glad you made it in. Yeah. And, uh, let's go back over to Ralph here. I know, Ralph, you talked about the, uh, the touchscreen setup, but uh, you and I have been working on that uh, war machine as well. You want to tell everybody uh, kind of what's going on with that and where we're at with that right now? Yes. Uh, like Boyd said, um, We've been working on the Martian war machine. I actually sent the, the actual model along with everything else down to Boyd so he can go through his uh, his uh, assembly and uh, painting, which he does well at, uh, much better than I could do. But also, is he's like a, my QC guy in this particular instance, is making sure that the paperwork was right and that everything is going to be able to be assembled. And uh, Boyd was uh, good enough to go through the board, and he found that uh, one of the sounds wasn't as good as it could be. So that's what we were working on today to make uh, the eye ray sound of the blast a little bit more uh, realistic. So we're going to be working on that. Uh, so therefore, unfortunately, it's going to be delayed probably by a week because I'm asking Boyd to send that board back because we may need to resynchronize the lights to the new proper sound so there's going to be a slight delay but um, I think it's going to be a, a nice board uh, because you'll have some control on uh, how many sounds you hear and how many lights uh, you know, the, the weapons that come on with the sound uh, you know I think will be it's going to be real nice it has the ship dying effect sound too so um, We'll probably show it, Boyd, right when it's all done as far as uh, we get all the sounds together, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> like I said earlier, uh, the TOS, uh, we're working on the 1-1000 TOS um, lighting kit. And, um, you know, after working with it, um, I've kind of grown, grown fond of that little model. Uh, it wasn't too bad to, to work with. Uh, the pylons are thin, but they're thick enough where we actually ran four-wire ribbon cable through it. I know you, some of you guys will use magnetic wire, and that's all well and good. Uh, the thickness of the ribbon cable is pretty close to the 30-gauge wire, uh, magnetic wire um, as well, maybe just a few mils thicker. Uh, but it, it went through okay. I took some pictures. I took videos of it. Uh, it will be on how to build type thing and um, after that after we get those two done um, we're gonna attack the b9 robot awesome um, yeah we'll wait for that one man that's yep. gonna be sweet too everything you've been doing lately Ralph is just phenomenal it's mm -hmm. unbelievable just one hit one hit one hit after the next <laughs> and I want to say <laughs> that uh, I want to say too that uh, uh, you know working on this little uh, war machine just a little bit here that you guys are gonna really like it when it comes out uh, Ralph has gone the extra mile on um, getting the little effects going on there. Like one of the features that he has that I hadn't seen on anybody else's stuff out there is uh, you got the separate weapon system besides the heat ray that comes out of the eye, you know, the little wing tips on the model. Uh, if I can kind of, well, I got the picture right here of the box. I guess I could show you. Um, you know, you've got this, uh, uh, you've got these uh, glowing wing tips right here. Uh, which you saw in the movie where everything kind of was just on. Well, when they fire their weapon out of here, I don't know if it's supposed to be a laser or, or a disruptor yeah. or whatever it's supposed to be, but uh, he's actually got that effect in there that actually flashes uh, in synchronization with the sound coming out of it uh, that's separate from the regular glowing of the wings. So you still have the background glow, 
but you get this bright, uh, you know, flashing uh, to simulate that weapon firing. And then up here at the eye, he's got a really nice like bicolored effect where it goes from uh, just being red to like getting you know that extra flash in it when it fired that heat ray, just like it does on the uh, movie. So it's a beautiful little kit, and it's really straightforward. It'll be, it, he's got it designed so everything fits in the model really nice, and uh, you don't really have to modify anything in the model to get it to work. And one of the ingenious things that I thought Ralph come up came up with was um, I've seen a lot of different videos where people were trying to uh, figure out how to get this. Uh, I'll show this again. This area right here, uh, the light diffused on it because you know you're, they were mounting LEDs or LED strip like right up against that, and you were getting these big hot spots. And I saw people were doing everything from putting in uh, wads of cotton to uh, uh, wax paper or you know painting it on the inside. Now what Ralph came up with is, uh, I think I could probably pull this part out of here and show you really quick. Um, yeah, I can show that. You can see here on the front uh, that it has a uh, a bulkhead that's molded in here, and what a lot of people were doing was cutting that out. You know, assuming that that you're going to have to get the light to go through and hit this uh, uh, transparent green part here in the front. But what Ralph did is he left that piece in place, and he just put a, a strip of LED tape behind that. And it's something that I like to do pretty often too. Is that you can you know you can use your actual uh, styrene to diffuse your light and let me tell you, when you put that little front piece on there, you get no light leaks at all, and that lighting comes through for that LED strip right through this plastic and right into that green, and you get a beautiful, uh, nice, uh, even glow coming out of that, and uh, no need to do any kind of painting on the inside or uh, diffusion of any kind. So the kit, uh, if you follow his instructions that are very nicely done and very easy to understand, uh, and where to mount everything, he's got nice uh, big pictures in there that you can see where all the components are laid out and it works out really really nice so that was a great idea you had with that Ralph and that solved that problem right off the bat yeah I was um, you know I was gonna do LEDs and I said wait a minute if I because I happen to have a, a complement of LED light strips and these are not even the double density this is just a single density that's and, right you know, and you you know on that ship it's got those mounting pegs right up front there behind that main saucer section of the big eye that's and right. I just, on the top, it, they're longer, right? And if you put that LED strip on a semicircle right around those uh, three pegs, it's just enough depth where, and that uh, styrene is thick enough where it diffuses the light. Perfect. Now, you couldn't ask for any better. So I, I was happy with the result, and I said, let's use the LED strip. Right, yeah, and I'll show this part again here if I can get the shade on it. There you go. You can see the pegs we're talking about right here. He's got the little strip of LED just running right across these three little pegs right here. Standing on its edge, he just glued the ends to these pegs on the outside edge and facing forward, and uh, that just works out phenomenal. It, it solves that problem in one, uh, one fell swoop. So that was a great idea there, Ralph. With nothing there to diffuse it, huh? Just glued right there to those pegs? It, yeah, it's, it goes through there. Like I said, there's a, you can see it here, maybe a, I'll get a little bit of shade on it, but you can see on the upper oh, yeah. and lower section, you can see a little, there's a bulkhead mold, molded in there. So oh, the, there uh, so the uh, LED going through that, it diffuses it perfect, and it doesn't discolor it or anything when you put those green parts on there. I mean, it, it looks just absolutely just right. And yeah, the same thing on the wingtips. He's just got an LED... Um, uh, sitting in there and then the the one that's firing the uh, you know that fires the little weapons that we move those a little bit and, and extended them out just a little bit so they're actually into the uh, green plastic tip so they're you know they're a little bit more highlighted than the rest of it and when they fire you definitely see there's a difference between just glowing and you know when they actually come on the glow what's nice is that you know somebody else might have just used that all in one thing but he continues to have the glowing going on in the background, but you see the weapon firing separately, just yeah. like it looked on the movie. So that's uh, really nice that he made that little extra, went the extra mile on that. Ralph, uh, that that PCB is that that PCB kit um, is that specific for that kit, or is that another one that you have available uh, for what the Martian War Machine? Yeah, yeah. What what it is is actually it's the same board that we use for the phaser photon effect. Okay, 
what we did is we added, uh, uh, we were able to do a little bit of cut and jump and added a third switch input. The, the, usually the photon and phaser, there's two uh, buttons, one for the, to fire the phaser, one to fire right. the photon. So with the Martian war machine, we have the, the phasers, or the la in this case the lasers, out of the wingtips, and we also have the eye ray blast. So uh, that, you know, we just mimic that and change it instead of a photon, it's the eye ray blast. But we auto also added the ship dying sound with it, so we used a different, another input because we had multiple inputs still available, Enoch. Uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah, actually, I, I, the board should be coming in any day now. Uh, that that same board has been, I, I, I had it redesigned like months ago, but I was working my inventory down. And I have a customer that's, uh, he's a large customer, and he wanted to purchase uh, that type of effect. And I told him, hang on one second, uh, because we fire his a little bit differently than we fire our standard. Um, uh, when I say fire, it's the, type, the way we engage the buttons. That's, that's different. Uh, so what I did is I said, let me uh, add a couple more resistors on the board to achieve what you need to get achieved. So that board is coming in. So it, it, to you guys, it doesn't matter because this board, um, uh, you know, Boyd has the board. This board has uh, quick, has little micro connectors on it. So basically, you don't have to solder anything to the printed circuit board on this case. Oh, you, whoa. Yeah, you, you mount the board where you wish. Now, this particular Martian war machine, the board will actually fit inside the Martian war machine saucer. Or, if you don't feel comfortable, you can mount it in the base, because you're going to need a base anyway to yeah. mount the speakers. So if you mount the, the, <clears throat> the PC board in the saucer, you have to come down to the base with six wires. If you mount the board in the base, you have to go up to the saucer with eight wires. So, <laughs> you know, it's a trade-off of how many wires go where. Or how big the, you know, the, yeah. the your so, tubing is going to be from the stand or whatnot. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, things like that. So you can put it wherever you want. Uh, so even though we get a new board, as far as you're concerned, hey, Ralph, I'm still connecting these two connectors here, and the wires are still the same wires, they go to here and there, so it won't make any difference to you, it'll just make it easier for us, tenant controls, to produce them with, um, you know, without cutting cuts and jumpers, but, right. um, that, you know, that's the good thing about these different types of boards that we have, we now have a, 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 a nice horizontal base of family of controls that we can do many different things. Uh, with these controls. I mean, we've been doing this for now, what, four years now? Uh, so it's evolving. Every yeah. time we we add something, we, we change the board. Like that little car board was really the deflector dish board. That's the new deflector dish board. And we made it do more things. So that little board now, does it does the cars. <clears throat> Excuse me. It does the deflector dish. It's going to do the whole lighting system in the TOS it's going to do the buzzards and the nabs all on that one board. Uh, so you can see there's, a, there's applications um, that come about in using these boards. And we just build on it. You know, so yeah. so we, we have quite a few boards. The Combo D board is still um, a, a workhorse. That's got like 10 outputs. But we can make it do many different more things depending how fancy we want to get with the software. Uh, so. It's um, you know it's there. We got a big platform to build upon now. I mean the LCAS will act. So what we're doing, Enoch, is we're building a pyramid with a wide, wide base. Yeah. So now from that horizontal base, now we can go vertically. Right. And make a a whole family of controls for other ships. Yeah. Um, well, know, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean I I've been in the IT industry for years, and so and I've worked for number of different um, large scale manufacturers and just the way and I apologize if I'm going to go on here a little bit but um, just sort of looking at your products and just from looking at the, the applications level this sort of flat base you're talking about is really really interesting I'm really interested in. and uh, also just being a noob at 
doing my own home electronics and looking at boards and trying to figure out how to do flashers and using the 555 and a, right. you know, a bunch of all that stuff. What you're doing is so much beyond what you know I could do just sort of scratch building something on my own PCB that it's really interesting and your price points and all that are, are, are right on too. So um, I hope you don't mind if I fire you a couple of emails in the coming weeks about uh, my upcoming projects. I mean, there, well, there are ways down the ways. I still need to finish the spring build, so I need not well, get too well, excited about lighting. But, um, yeah, thanks a lot. It's really cool. Really, really interesting stuff you're doing. Well, like like I said, you know, I don't know if you heard this, but I've said it in, in the past. I'll probably say it in the future. Listen, we're here to do things that you guys can't do or don't want to do, okay? Yeah. Um, I like to do my own things. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that I've made that I could have purchased, but I'm like you. I'm no different. I want to do it myself. Uh, there's a, quite a few people out there, and I'm, I'm sure there's many more that want to do it themselves. And that's fine, you know. Um, like I said, we're here to do things that you guys don't want to do. If you want to spend time on building versus uh, designing circuits and what have you, uh, that's fine. We're, we're here to help. And if you want to do it yourself, that's, that's all well and good. So we're just here, and uh, if you guys need it, um, we'll hopefully can supply it. But uh, yeah, you know, the, you know, getting back to what you guys were saying, I won't spend too much time, but it's it's not like the, I'm the genius um, <laughs> as far as the, the controls and the way we're gonna we went about it. Uh, I've been in this business, not in the hobby business, but in the controls business for over 35 years. I, I work in this industry. We make all sorts of process controls, and that's what our company did from the first day I joined when I was right out of, uh, you know, high school and college. Is basically I was indoctrinated in the way of lean manufacturing. We had boards that we could build that could do many different things for many different customers, and we're a boutique company. We we make. We make well, literally hundreds of controls, but we don't make thousands of them. Um, we, like when I say boutique, we we're into we're into railroads, like uh, metro, you know, like metro subways, Amtrak, to MRI machines. Nobody knows we're there because we are an electronic nut and bolts behind the system. Uh, most of our stuff, some people we do proprietary work. In other sure. words, they use our control, but it's, it's made to Becker and Dickinson. I'm sure you guys know who Becker and Dickinson is. They right. make a lot of medical stuff. So I use that same approach for tenant controls. Sure, because so, that way you, you got this, this, this broad base of products that you can don't have to like design from the ground up for each individual customer or each individual electronic right. board. And that's why Enoch, we went the microprocessor route, because yeah. you make the same body but you make it do many different things. Right. With and the it's, same architecture. It's not using is it is it using like an Arduino type base? No. No. We use we use strictly uh, microchips. Uh, okay. And, and we program them. So those our, are all coded individually for each application. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh. All right, Boyd, I'm going to get off my high horse. And oh, no, no. no. <laughs> I could listen to this stuff for hours, and I'm sure a lot of people could, too. It's a fascinating yeah. subject, Ralph, and I appreciate it again how uh, you are always more than willing to provide uh, the details and the information and keep us abreast of what's going on. We always really appreciate it. I think it's all really exciting and uh, a lot of cool stuff to look forward to in the next couple months coming out of Tenant Controls. I'm going to show you guys real quick because we want to get to our main theme tonight and start asking our questions about uh, the uh, interview coming up here this weekend with the pe uh, people out in LA. But just a couple quick things from my bench here that I've been working on. You guys might have seen this already, but this is my little uh, uh, chariot that I'm working on from Lost in Space. Uh, this is the 124th Mobius kit. I've just uh, been doing some painting on it. I got to do the uh, interior on this thing next and get all the uh, wiring and all my. Uh, fiber optics put in that and I've got the little robot here with it you can see he's in scale with this thing mm -hmm. and uh, some fiber optics on that we're gonna put this all in a nice uh, base and uh, kinda look at I guess maybe it's like a little bit of a rocky kind of terrain and uh, make it look like it's in a natural setting I was looking around for uh, some 124th figures for this thing but they don't they don't seem to be available anymore but um, talking about the Enterprise refit I've been working on my 350 here 
And uh, last night I worked on the first part of the Aztecs, and hopefully if I can get this in the right light for you, you guys can maybe see that on there. Yep. This camera might not show it too well, but um, you can maybe see a little bit of the gloss on there, I guess. But, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, the first part of that. we got a long ways to go. We're going to be starting to come up the sides here and up onto the neck. And talking about how uh, when I build these models, you can see that this whole assembly is finished. Uh, all the putty work, everything is done on this. Um, and this is what I was talking about earlier with Enoch is that for me to go around and do all this Aztec painting on it, like in this state right here, it's a lot easier to do it than if I had the saucer and the nacelles and yeah. everything on it. Where I'd be, you know, flopping it around and and risking cracking some of my seams or something like that, and I can get to all these areas. Yeah. Uh, they're they're all out in the open and everything. So that makes sense because yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense that you've got the saucer off, and I'll, I'm, that's pretty much convinced me that's the route to go. I'm gonna do all the paintwork on this, including you know, like all the Aztecs that go on the pylons, on the neck, and then um, all the detail painting after that. You know, that's what I'll finish with all the. The dark colors, you know, like the duck egg blue that goes on the leading edge of the pylons and around the neck and all that. So basically that entire assembly will be done, and then I'll go to the saucer and then go to the nacelles at the very end and uh, put it all together. And just have to fix a couple of little light leaks on it here and there when that's all done. So, uh, so on the subject of the refit then, guys, um, we're going to go ahead now and open this up to questions. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show tonight, I'm heading out to L.A. Uh, I'm leaving this Friday to meet Paul Olson, Jim Dow, and Richard Taylor and a couple other people that uh, were involved in the original Star Trek The Motion Picture. And being that that uh, particular movie kind of started it all, uh, it's also kind of funny that that, that movie is probably one of the least uh, documented movies that they did. I don't think when they made the movie that um, they anticipated, I mean, I'm sure they were hopeful, but I didn't think they anticipated what kind of a franchise that it was going to kick off and they were going to do five more uh, movies with the original crew and then several more with the next generation and beyond but uh, so that movie wasn't the behind the scenes and what they did and everything wasn't uh, really documented if you go look at uh, some of the later movies you can find videos and DVDs and stuff about what they did on the special effects but so this is an opportunity for uh, modeling fans uh, to ask questions uh, from the masters of the trade, as you want to say, these guys are all Academy Award-winning uh, special effects guys. Uh, went on to all have very distinguished careers, and um, so what I wanted to do to do tonight was uh, see if there were anybody uh, anybody that had any questions that they wanted to uh, pass along. When I'm out there, I'll be happy to ask some questions for you guys, uh, and it's kind of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So with that, I'm going to open it up to. Uh, Go around the room here first, and we'll see if we have anything come in over the uh, uh, Q and A app here. So, Adam, we're going to start off with you and see if you have anything that comes to mind. I do. Um, what I like to ask them is, is how do they determine the actual size of the miniature they're going to ultimately film, and uh, what influenced them to to determine that? Um, you know, they could have gone with just about anything, but um, that I guess that's the main question on my mind. That's a good one, too, yeah, and that's one I hadn't heard before. So, yeah, I'm sure there's a story behind that, and I'll definitely uh, mark that one down, Adam. Thank you for that one. Bet. Armando, how about you? Yeah, there's so many questions. Uh, <laughs> I guess I'm interested in the nuts and bolts of how they built the thing. Uh, what was it composed of? What kind of wood? How did they choose the materials? Uh, whether they used screws, nails, glue? Uh, of course, the paint. I'm really interested in, in the paint job. Also, the lighting, the types of circuits they use, the lighting. As as modelers, we're all interested in in how those things are done. This is a big model, and it was 30 years ago. But I'm I'm still very curious as to how they achieved all that. So you know, a few questions about the nuts and bolts of how the model was built would be nice. Those are great questions, Armando, and I'll definitely mark that one down too. Thank you very much. And Chris, how about you? Well, you know, I guess my question is, there's going to be a question to be asked, is the original poster for the motion picture featured the Phase 2 Enterprise. We all know this. I want to know how they got changed the design from that Phase 2 to what we got as the refit. That's probably the question that would be most in my mind. 
Right. That's a big one that I've got on my mind, too. You know, there's a whole kind of a, what do you want to call it, the missing link, if you want to no, say that, between um, uh, the, it's the original the phase concept. Two. Right, phase yeah, the original concept of the Phase 2 going into how the refit actually turned out mm -hmm. for the movie, which uh, uh, I think you can see that there was definitely some refinement there. And uh, I'm, I, sir, my personal opinion is that had they gone with the uh, the strict design of the Phase Two Enterprise, it was it was a little bit a little bit better here and there, but it wasn't so great here and there. And the, the you know the finished refit design was just beautiful from every angle. It, it's like it's like they zeroed in on all the areas that they thought uh, didn't look too good on the on the uh, Phase Two and just perfected it. You know, so yeah, I'm very interested in that same thing. That's a good one, Chris. All right. I've got one that's coming here from the model dude. Uh, question to ask Richard Taylor in Paul's 2013 interview. You mentioned that you had ideas for the Enterprise that Gene Roddenberry kept rejecting. Would you have had the chance to build the ship you wanted? What would it have looked like? Now that's a good one. I'm, that's an interesting question too. And thanks for that one, model dude. Definitely keep that one in mind. And uh, Craig, how about you? Have you got anything you'd like to uh, ask those guys? No, I've had. Uh, I'm half asleep here. It's like nearly four <laughs> o'clock. <laughs> no, I, I don't have no questions at the minute. That's Thank understandable. You stay late, though, sir. <laughs> okay. And how about you, Dave? I think my question is: is <clears throat> well, Mondo was some of it, the nuts and bolts. But for Jim Dow, what what led him into this profession that he wound up, you know? Was it just a childhood, you know, like everybody else doing something as a child and worked his way into it? Or is it something he just, you know, decided to do later on, you know? Yeah, very interesting. I think that'll be a good question to ask all of those guys on how um, True. How, how they uh, wound up in that. Now, I know uh, in Paul's book, you know, if you bought the book or the e-book, you got a link to some videos that he did where they shot some interviews with those guys last year and they did talk a lot about uh, the uh, you know not so much how what led them to that but you know how they were in the the, uh, the union and how they had to work certain ways to get into certain shops and things like that but the question is still out there as far as what what led them to get into that general career before you even talk about any of the unions or any of the uh, working in Hollywood or anything or the specific people they worked for you know so that that's right. Was he uh, was he just really creative and you know always been that way, or is it something that you know he just decided I wanted to check into and go? You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. So yep, that's a that's good, a good one. question too. Like how, how many of the you know I'm not too familiar with either of the um, their backgrounds, but you know how many of them come from like a fine arts background? You know, because a lot. I mean, a lot of that scratch building early stuff on that scale. I mean that's really 3D um, sculpting and how much you know what, if if any of them came from a really heavy fine house background would be a good question. Well, uh, I do know that they mentioned in their in their interviews uh, in the in the ones that they shot last year that most, if not all, of them were in some type of a fine arts uh, uh, school for modeling. I know that Mark Stetson, who did a lot of the work, was actually in school when he got the call to uh, go over to the studio and start doing work. So yeah, they definitely were in school, but. I think Dave's question is, okay, you know, you're in the school, but what compelled you to go to the school in the first place? You know, I mean, what, what right. triggered it way back when uh, that you knew that that was something that you wanted to do? So, yeah, that's all good stuff, and I will definitely ask that one because that's uh, going to add to the whole history of the thing. Eric, how about you? What are you thinking about? What would you like to ask these guys if you had the chance? Well, I wrote down three, but I guess I, um, I guess were they really surprised that people actually wanted, like, realistic blueprints of the ships and, you know, where everything was and all of the little nuts and bolts details that you would find on a, a real ship that size. People just wanted blueprints and where was everything? Where was the captain's, you know, um, this and that was. And next was, uh, were they totally, were they tempted to totally change the Enterprise? Just make an all new ship. Mm -hmm. That's a good one, Eric. And I do know that uh, again, going back to their uh, their interviews last year uh, and looking at them and kind of getting a take from that and the direction that we're going to go this time, I do know that um, uh, 
Richard Taylor, who designed the refit, I think he took over and changed the design from the Phase 2 edition, uh, and said he had quite a few, if you want, not really tussles, but sort of minor disagreements with Gene Roddenberry, because Richard is an engineer, a mechanical engineer by background. And so uh, talking to the people at NASA, uh, he had a concept or an idea of, okay, what, what he, he wanted to apply... Uh, some things that were like more like what real spaceships would do in, in a theoretical, you know, warp environment or a light speed environment. And but Gene Ronberry definitely had a set of ideas uh, where it, there's kind of some funny stuff in that er earlier interview where Gene just said, "I don't care what you know NASA says. It's got to have a saucer. It's got to have pylons, and it's got to have engines on the back. It's got to be the recognizable shape of the original Enterprise. That's a gimme." And uh, when it goes and it takes off, I want to see stars stretching in the background. And, uh, you know, people were saying, well, that's not really what you would see, you know, Gene, if you were traveling at the speed of light. You know, in theory, nobody really knows, but in theory. And he said, I don't care. I just want it to be, you know, this is what uh, Star Trek fans want, and this is what I want, and it's my movie. You know what I mean? So uh, he talked about all kinds of things, you know, like uh, – uh, I think one of the things talked about was the 12 foot door. You know, they got the airlock where they walk in. They go from the, uh, say, when they go from the travel pod to the inside the refit at the beginning, you know, Kirk and Scotty. Well, Gene wanted a 12 foot door, right? Well, uh, Richard Taylor, when they were getting ready to design those sets, you know, because they wound up not only designing uh, the miniatures, but they got they got work involved in the work of creating some of the, the full size sets, you know, that the actors were going to be using. And this 12-foot door turned out to be a really big problem. And, you know, for example, uh, one of the things he talks about was, okay, in the scene where you see the travel pod, you know, backing up against the wall of the ship, and it's going to dock, right? There's a porthole right next to the, uh, right next to where the travel pod's going to dock, and there's a woman looking out the, tra the, the porthole, you know, at the travel pod as it's going to approach. And they're basically saying, okay, where is that 12-foot door going? You know, is it going in the wall? Uh, and rolling back out of the way or whatever, you know, or how is that working? Well, you got all these portholes right next to it. And, you know, where where does that material go? You know, so he was like, hey, you know, that that's I guess we'll just do it and we won't explain, uh, you know, where, how that works or whatever, you know, because, again, Gene Romberg said, I don't care. I want it to be, you know, this particular way. So I do plan on asking him a lot about that. And uh, uh, so there's some, yeah, there's some really interesting stuff there with that. And, uh how they ironed it all out and came to an agreement, you know, so. I guess that's uh, sort of the answer to my third question was, was how much pressure do you feel about upgrading into Starship Enterprise? You got it both ways. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, uh, they were they were allowed to be creative, but they were, they were given a certain template. You know what I mean? There was a template. It sounds to me like there was definitely a template in place that they – they couldn't cross over certain areas and stuff, so, and that's probably pretty good, you know. I mean, because we, we would, I think we would have all freaked out if, uh, you know, we we saw the Enterprise from the original series, all of a sudden appear uh, in the new movie as like maybe like a, a big sausage shape or something, you know, no, <laughs> no more pylons, no more, uh, you know, saucer, <laughs> you know, a radical change, and people said that's not the Enterprise, you know what I mean? I mean, look at all the look at all the grief they've gone through with the. Uh, Every time they redesign the ship, you know, you got somebody that's happy and somebody who's not. So that's a yeah. really touchy subject. I, mean, I got, Ron, another, I got Ron, another question here from uh, the model dude. It said, I would ask Jim Dow, today's technology has changed how special effects are done compared to how they were in the 1970s. If you were able to build the Enterprise today, what things would be would you be able to do with today's materials that you couldn't do back then? So that's a good one, too. And yeah, uh, we'll definitely one. check that one out. All right. And uh, John, how about you? Have you got anything you'd like to ask these guys? Well, I, I watched the show a couple of times where uh, they were blowing off steam or I don't know if they were getting stressed from uh, so many hours they were putting in. But I'd like to know, seriously, how they came to be putting things in the uh, saucer section. <laughs> <laughs> was that blowing off yeah. steam? Was it a party? What was going on at the time? Yeah, I but, uh, I'll once I've definitely I heard, heard those stories. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely heard those stories, John, and I'll try to get into a little bit more detail on that. That's a good one, too. All right, and Enoch, how about you? What would you like to ask these guys? Oh, man, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to put some thought into it. I mean, one, I mean, I think the obvious question, and I think that we've seen it in the other interviews, too, or, you know, their their thoughts on, on CGI and, and, and 
compared to you know the work that was done in um, you know in the seventies. Um, and you know, I'm not too sure on how much of that group was involved in ILM afterwards, too, or, or their thoughts on that, um, on the ILM model group. Mm -hmm. Well, I know for a fact that Jim Dow, in the process of working on, you know, he built most of the models. He was like the main model maker guy. That uh, he did hire his brother on. His brother wasn't working at the time. His brother came on board uh, for Star Trek: The Motion Picture in sort of a minor role. But when they went to Star Trek II and did uh, the effects over at ILM, his brother was completely in charge of that. I, I believe he was the art director over there, uh, so he got a, lot, a much bigger role uh, over at you know from then on. So yeah, that's something interesting too. Yeah. Also, I don't know. There, there isn't a whole lot of talk about the Oberth class two from Star Trek II. Um, Loose that I've been able to find, and that's one of my favorite ships is if they had any thoughts on the design concepts um, and model mock-up for that particular uh, that particular model. Mm -hmm. Yep, I can ask them. I'm not too sure uh, of that original group, how much involvement any of those guys had uh, on the movies beyond um, motion, motion picture, picture but uh, mm -hmm. there might be some knowledge or they may know of some of the people that, you know, went over and worked on that. Like I said, Jim's brother was involved, so he might be able to get some information about that. Yeah, because that, oh. that model, there's not a whole lot of information about. Um, right. Being one of my favorites, and you know, I'd like to scratch build one or do something with one at some point. Uh, I even have a guy that's working on, a, has molds casting of one uh, in Kansas. He's working on molding those up for me. Um, and I'll post more about that on the forum. But yeah, any information you can dig about the over would be great. All right, excellent. And Ralph, I know it's not really your thing, but uh, would you have anything that might interest you from that? Uh, from that, yeah. uh, <clears throat> I would, uh, since I'm an electronics guy, I'd like to hear how they came about thinking of what to put in there, how to do it, and things like that. And uh, the other thing is, uh, I don't know if the three guys were around when the filming was going on, but how did all those actors interact with each other? Was it a, a camaraderie? <laughs> was it? A, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like I'm the boss and you, I'm going to do it this way. You know, is there uh, some uh, tension between the actors on Star Trek? Uh, right. Was it a smooth sailing, so to speak. I was, I was just wondering behind the scenes if, if they were there and if they had any knowledge of it. Well, that's a really interesting question because I, I know for a fact that, you know, different uh, readings that I've done, and I'm sure a lot of you have out there, and there's been uh, a little bit of stuff on the background, they were all under a pressure uh, to make this a success because uh, they kind of thought it was a one-shot deal, you know, like if you didn't do it right. Uh, and that's why the budget for the movie just absolutely bloated into a, uh, you know, I think they talked about on there that the movie originally was budgeted <laughs> around $30, 30 million, which was a lot of money in 1978, 79. Mm -hmm. And it wound up being closer to around three hundred million dollars is what they spent on it in the end. Now in today's money, that'd be like a billion dollar movie. <laughs> so yeah. uh, that's uh, yeah, they um, they knew that they had to have something competitive with Star Wars, you know, because Star Wars came out just before it and it was a huge success. And they actually did Star Wars for fairly cheap. I think uh, I read somewhere they what they spent a little over twenty five million dollars making the original yeah. Star Wars. That's about and, right. And as fantastic as it is, uh, you know, they were just like, wow, how can they do that, you know? So, but yeah, there were so many script changes and so many things that they kept tweaking on the, uh, one of the things I know that was interesting they talked about, okay, like when you're doing filming, for example, um, you're, you're taking and you're shooting your special effects and they do what they call it's a daily, where you do your special effects shots and then at the end of the day you turn them into the lab, right? And they run the film through the processor and they take a look and say, okay, did does it look right or, or, or did something go wrong that maybe when you were shooting it and looking at it with your eye, you, you thought it was okay, but like maybe on the film you saw, oh man, there's somebody walking past in the background or something happened, right? Well, they were originally just sending the raw footage that they took up there, right? And you're talking uh, probably spending like a 13 or 14 hour day uh, shooting these this one little sequence that's only going to be about 10 seconds long in the movie. They sent it over to the lab, right? And this machine that they had it apparently it took it a while to get going, right? So when you put the raw uh, footage through there, uh, the first few, you know, maybe like 
40 or 50 feet of the film, it wasn't up to speed or something was wrong and it scratched the crap out of it, right? So like, so like your whole day's worth of work, I remember Jim Dow talking about that saying, wow, you know, we had like a perfect shot. But we got the we got the report back from the lab after we did the daily. It said, "Oh yeah, we had a you know you had a good shot there, but we ruined the film." So <laughs> what they find out wound up doing is they would put like a hundred foot of what they call leader, which is just blank film, you know, nothing on it at all, and attach it to the to the real footage that they wanted to show, so that it would run through there and everything the machine would get. This is you know the primitive technology they were using, you know, an old some kind of old machine, you know, and it would take it a while to get its sea legs and then finally it would get all stabilized and hopefully stabilized by the time the good film went through it and then they would get their shots and they started you know making a little bit more progress but he was talking about how many days they wasted you know 13 14 hour days you know working seven days a week you know, everybody thinks that working in those films is all uh, glamour and everything but boy it, listening to these guys you know they're pulling uh, sometimes 60 70 hour shifts you know maybe sleeping about four or five hours uh, you know, it's definitely not, it's not all glamour or whatever, you know, it sounds like it's really hard work. So, uh, some interesting stuff like that, too. But Okay, let's see, I'll just check real quick and see if we've got anything um, coming in here anymore. Uh, let's see. I don't see anything new, guys. Um John has something new. I'm looking at. Okay, it right I've here. got one here from John Skaggs. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. It says my main question would be in going from the original design, which had an orange red lighting on the engines, to the blue lighting seen on the refit. What was the deciding factor behind that, and also the change between the copper to blue for the main deflector dish? Okay. Well, very good, John. I'll definitely ask him about that one. I appreciate the question. Uh, I have one more I'd like to ask Boyd if possible. Okay, sure, certainly. Um, they're designed for V'ger. You know, in the original movie, you never really get to see what V'ger fully looks like. And you do in the 2000, uh, in the uh, director's cut. So I was always wondering if they've ever seen the director's cut. Is that design of V'ger match what their design was back in 1979? Oh, yeah, very good question, Chris. As a matter of fact, yeah, uh, I know that uh, there's a, uh, a little documentary that's on YouTube uh, that someone did recently called uh, Behind the Effects or something like that, and there's a little short segment. They were talking about a lot of different movies, but they did have a little segment in there about Star Trek, and uh, it appears that uh, what they were showing there is that apparently there was a full-size V'ger. That, I mean, they built the entire... Uh, detail of it. In fact, um, that's some of what Paul Olson uh, wound up working on uh, in post-production uh, after he, uh, you know, he finished up his work on the refit on the painting of it. They sent him over to another department, and he was working on some of that. And um, so, yeah, that's a very good question because uh, I know that they had built up quite a bit of it, but they wound up not using it because they were, you know, starting to realize, hey, if we show everything that we want to show, this movie's going to be like, you know, three and a half hours long. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of stuff got cut out. But, uh, yep, that's definitely a good one, too, that I'll definitely ask him about. Okay, guys, uh, I think that was a great session. Uh, appreciate the questions. Unless has, uh, anybody has anything else, I think we're getting close to wrapping this up. Uh, we'll conclude here with any... Uh, since we've got everybody on the bench, if anybody watching or anybody here has any modeling questions that they want to ask anybody else here on the panel or anybody that's watching, uh, go ahead and feel free to fire up those before we close here. But boy, I was wondering, is that the same B9 robot you had in the sauce? Oh, no, no, uh, Eric. Uh, this guy here, he's a uh, 124 scale. Uh, okay. He's uh, in the same scale as the uh, chariot. That little uh, robot that I used in the Jupiter 2 is a 135th scale. Uh, the only one that I could find, that's actually a Johnny Lightning uh, right. matchbox guy. He's not even a model, but I modified him a little bit and you know did some lighting on that. Okay. Looks like Tag put up something there, boy. I just see that now. Yep, it says, uh, when you ask them questions, I would like to know anything about the painting from the primer to the colors that were used, uh, like uh, the names or swatches that, that they could get to match. Okay, so specific about the colors 
and if they actually know the names of those colors that we used. Okay, Tag, I'll definitely ask them that. I know uh, uh, Paul uh, had uh, mentioned specifically in his book the exact colors that he used for the refit, and those were uh, paints that were available back in the 70s, but I'm not even sure if they're available anymore, but we'll do our best on that one. We'll try to get you some information on that. How's your line coming along, boy? It's doing okay, Eric. Um, it's on the back burner a little bit right now. Um, I'm getting some photo etch done with uh, my good friend um, uh, Elliot Brown over at Fedoratron or Warm Plastic. He's got two different companies over there, and uh, he's uh, what, what we're having to do is we tried to upscale uh, the uh, photo etch parts from the uh, uh, paragraphics, uh, you know, uh, one five three seven uh, parts, you know obviously modify them because you don't want to just copy somebody else's work. You know, we're going to kind of right. use those as a reference, but um, they, they they won't work because they're, the shapes on the actual De Boer's model are completely different than uh, uh, what the 1537 kit is. And um, so what's going to have to happen here is we're going to have to do actual tracings of the parts and get those tracings over to Elliot and get him to, you know, whatever method he uses to transfer a tracing onto his photo etch making process uh, so he's right. actually going to have to create the files and make everything fit precise. We're trying to do things like the uh, the airlock hatches, the uh, grills that go on the um, the top of the saucer behind the BC deck, the uh, grills that go on the impulse engines, you know, a few little details like that. Right, and it wouldn't look right unless you know, because it's such a large scale you have to put in a few more details for, on it. Yeah. It I think the De Boers, uh, they did a lot more research on getting it shaped more exactly like the studio model than the AMT kit. So yeah, there's definitely going to be a difference in the um, in the shape of the parts, you know. So that's kind of where that's sitting. It won't be too much longer. Elliot already sent me a, a set of test parts, and they just need to be adjusted a little bit. Um, so we're working on that, and then we can move forward. I don't want to do much too much more because you want to do most all my, uh, you know, fitting of those parts and make sure that's all going to work before I proceed with much more of the assembly. But uh, it's coming along. Appreciate you asking about it. Just want to make sure you don't fall behind me. <laughs> no. Uh, let me see. I thought I saw another question come in here. Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, nope, I don't see anything new, guys. So... Um, I guess if anything uh, else about the modeling questions, guys, or we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. We're coming on uh, a little after 10 o'clock here, so. Yeah, I think I'm good. Everybody else? I'm good. Okay, yeah. guys. All right, well, uh, we'll close this up uh, like usual by saying that we really appreciate uh, everybody that came along for the panel tonight, and thanks for sharing your time and your work with us guys and answering all the questions and helping each other out. Thanks again for uh, everybody in the audience that tuned in tonight and sent our questions in. I really appreciate that and um, I'll be out uh, in LA this next weekend when I come back. Hopefully we'll have some uh, new stuff to talk about and uh, I'm really looking forward to it so I guess we'll see you guys uh, next week and we'll have a little bit to talk about, about that and uh, get some more progress and Ralph I'm gonna as I go along on that war machine, I'm going to put out a, you know a couple little videos on that and show how how that thing's going together and everything, and uh, yep. people can use that for reference later on. So, right, that's a wrap, guys. I got so. my kit. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a good point. We better order a kit before you release those videos because they're going to be gone. What <laughs> it's on YouTube. <laughs> Oh, I think when people see Ralph's lighting kit, yeah, that's that's yeah. going to be pretty popular. So the kit's going to be gone. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, guys. Well, again, I appreciate it very much. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, we're going to wrap things up. So until we see everybody next week, we're going to say good night, John Boy, and happy modeling, everyone. Good night, John Boy. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>